Thank you all. Yeah. I think we're now going to move to the Inspire MD session. I would like to urge you to stay seated because we will be continuing with the carotid session afterwards. And it's my pleasure, but I haven't seen him yet. Dr. De Donato, is he here? Yeah, fine. So the first speaker of our session is Dr. De Donato, and he'll be talking about carotid stenting through the eyes of OCT analysis, the benefits of Micronet. The catwalk is yours. Go ahead. To my experience with the optical coherence tomography in carotids and even to show the benefit of Micronet. So here is my disclosures. And what is OCT? OCT is an intravascular high resolution imaging technology. This is a very well known in, in coronary field and it offers images at nearly histological resolutions. Back in 2012, we were able to set a protocol to use this technology in carotids. With a non-occlusive flashing of the carotids, we were able to gain a lot of information from our carotids. That was a very nice tool to understand the plaque characterization. And you, you can see the plaque type regarding the calcium, the attenuation, the backscattering of the infrared signals. As well, you can uh, calculate the degree of stenosis, the areas of stenosis, the ulceration, the surface of your plaque, the presence or not of thrombus. But probably it's even more interesting when you try to study the interaction between the plaque and the stent. So this is what we did at that time. We studied, we evaluated the stent apposition, the malapposition. Maybe you can have some strut that are floating into the lumen. Maybe you can have fibrous cap rupture, microprolapse, big prolapse, combination of fibrous cap rupture and plaque microprolapse. So at that point, it's very clear from my side that having a high resolution imaging sometimes can really make the difference. And so if you clearly see things, maybe that they are wrong, maybe they are something that you can, you, can, you can change, but it's important to understand. So at the, after a few years, we started with a kind of evaluation between stent design. We evaluated the stent malaposition, the plaque prolapse, the fibrous cap rupture, and we found out that according to the stent design that uh, we were able to analyze at that time, of course, we had a closed cell stent, open cell stent, the hybrid stent, and we did this uh, evaluation that was an offline analysis of all uh, OCT frames. These are uh, uh, by frames analysis every one millimeter into the carotid. We evaluate the uh, position of the strut. What we realized, we realized that the uh, closer stents are a, lot, a little bit less conformable. So you can find out more malaposition with the red colon, so the closed cell. But at the same time, the open cell, the one who is uh, more conformable, sometimes have the stent strut just pushing, sorry, pushing against the plaque. So you see some strut just embedded inside the plaque. And uh, what is really quite disappointing was that the plaque prolapse, perhaps that was very frequent. In a frame slide, in a slide based analysis, we had up to 68% of black products with open cell that was better for close, even for hybrid. And the, what about the new stands? We, we know that to the second generation stands, we have better results. This is uh, the meta analysis, the systemic review, together with the group of Piotr and Muzalek. We understood that we compare a result of the first generation versus second generation stent, we have a better uh, composite endpoint of uh, death, stroke, and myocardial infarction. And even if we focus only on the neurological complication, like uh, uh, just 30 day stroke, we have a, a better outcome with second generation, even in comparison to just closed cell stent coming from the first generation. So what about OCT with this new stent? We have, of course, analyzed the result with the Turumo Red Saver, the double layer nitinol design, and with the Inspire, the true, what I call the true, the real mesh stent, the Micronet, the PET Micronet with a very small cell size of just 150 to 180 microns. And you can see here that we have a very smooth surface. We have a nice coverage of the plaque. Even sometimes you can find out some uh, prolapse to the sense strut. This is still the micronet containing the majority of a prolapse. And here's some data in, uh, in uh, this future analysis. 
And uh, here is the comparison, the first two columns, Seagard and Rod Saver, compared to the historical result that I showed you before. And uh, if you focus on the plaque prolapse, you see that the Seagard and the Rod Saver offer less plaque prolapse, in particular Seagard, especially if you do even a sub-analysis of plaque pra pra prolapse between the two uh, second generation stent, you can see here that according to the gray weight classification, when you face with the most risky plaque, the type 1 and 3, you have a 9% of prolapse with Seagard and 20% with Rod Sever. So that led me to conclude that when you are able to have a, a very nice view from even from inside with 3D reconstruction, what you realize that with the open cell stent, the first generation, we have, you have a kind of a irregular surface inside your stents. With dual layer, much better, but still a quite big metal amount in the lumen. With the, the micronet, probably you have a very small surface, so definitely we are going to tailor our procedure to offer precision medicine, even for carotid artery stenting, and for example, when I deal with symptomatic plaque like that with ulceration and I want to do carotid artery stenting for some reasons in the, instead of carotid arterectomy, wow. definitely OCT offer me a clear view of what is inside the artery and then the definitive treatment in my practice is with a mesh stent. That was the case of Seagard 830 and this is the final result with again OCT after the stent implantation. You can see here the smooth surface, the complete plaque uh, coverage, and uh, even the 3D images again uh, show you that very nice and regular uh, surface with this uh, final atom. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I would uh, like you to ask you to join the rest of the panel and then we go back to our colleague from Madrid who is very eager to tell us about access strategies and I think this will be explained now, clinical updates and access strategies in carotid stentin. Dr. Leal. Thank you, Leal. Thank, thank you to the Inspire MD team to, for, for inviting us to this, to this session. Thank you all for being here. And the carotid artery stentin debate Again. Really? Again? I'm a big fan, okay? It's my first option in most of my carotid artery disease patients. But even being a big fan, we all should agree that there is a relative weakness by its nature, and it's related to microembolization. And I think the discussion here is nowhere. We have, we do have this problem. But let me tell you that this terminology, carotid artery stenting, it's a source of misunderstandings, that we have been living with it, and the embolic protection device you use, the stent you use and your access route would be playing major roles in your travel to success. So this is another debate, the stent design one. And it's quite alive in other territories. For example, if you are, these are captures of the program of this great meeting, and you have this debate in the SFA, below the knee, everywhere, but it's not so vibrant in the carotid territory. And this is probably because we have seen a lot of conflicting results uh, comparing open cell stents, closed cell stents, newest new designs, and conflicting results always lead to this kind of recommendations. Stent design should be considered at the discretion of the operator. I will try this. C'est toi qui décide. Okay, not bad. It's up to you. It's up to you. Mm, okay. Basic science project. Send stones. Uh, okay, I need you to turn the to mute the video because I did this project with my kids, and you will hear the comments. Big net. Sands, sand stones outside the net. Same project. Send stones. Micro net. That one. What do you think it will happen? Yeah. 
even if you push hard. Yes. Small sand. So we have data to support this basic science project. I am sorry, I am showing this paper, and I have a lot of the authors in the audience. I have Laura somewhere, I have my friend Pierre Musialek here too, but this paper is great. It's great because it's a comparison between different standard signs, mainly comparing all the signs with new ones. And I don't want to use the term mesh-covered stands. I will, st will explain you why later. There is a significant improvement in clinical outcomes at 30 days using last-generation design stands. But these results are living together with a increase in the instant restenosis in the one-year follow-up in the road saver arm. So the results, the great results we have at 30 days, are not durable with all the new designs. And this is, again, not magic. It's not magic. It's because of the design. And look at this, look at this conclusion of this, of this paper. Individual new stents significantly varied in their performance at 30 days and 12 months, indicating a lack of a class effect. So design matters. And we have many features to compare if we are talking about the design of the Road Saver stent and the Inspire MD Seaguard stent. But mainly, we have a different micronet, we have a different frame, and we have a different pore size. So it's not magic at all. It's the result. So if you are, if you are taking pictures, I will stay out of the picture. No, I'm joking. It's not magic. It's engineering. It's design. So it's a design behind the clinical data. But we are missing something. As I told you, maybe we could place the stand design in the first row, but it's not just this that counts in your success. One minute left. It's your neuroprotection strategy, which includes your access and your, your neuroprotection device. Whenever I talk about this, I bring this slide. I'm sorry, it's becoming a classic. If you want to treat this, you have many different journeys to take. My personal answer is, why not? starting the journey in the nearest station. There is no class effect in the STEM design categories, but, and there is no class effect either in the embolic protection devices. And if you look a little bit through data and you compare clinical and subclinical embolization rates, you will see that the combination of transcarotid access with flow reversal will bring you the best results in terms of silent embolization in the brain, measured by MRI, or measured by TCD. This is thanks for, to you, Isabel, for this paper. So, my conclusion. Why not? Why don't we take the best of both worlds? Why don't we just take the newest design, the best design in terms of microembolization, and we add the best or one of the best neuroprotection strategies in terms of access and brain protection. And that's all from my part. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I have the next presentation, please? I just want to conclude this wonderful session and thank you again, InspireMD, for the opportunity with some results that were recently presented at Viva. And it's an honor to have one of the lead uh, investigators here, which is Piotr Muselek, and it's the Sea Guardians Pivotal Trial. And I will not dwell on long to this because we need to move to the next session, but it's a trial sponsored by InspireMD that took less than two years to include 316 patients at several sites in Europe and the US, including both symptomatic and asymptomatic cases. 
and they've included patients who were 80 or younger at high risk of carotid endarterectomy, so both symptomatic and asymptomatic, and everybody needed to be treated with the C card, but also required to have protection. Protection that was at the discretion of the expert who was treating the patients. And these are the demographics, so you can see that the majority of the patients were asymptomatic, 25% were symptomatic, and all of them had distal protection. Well, ma the majority had distal protection, some had proximal or the combination. There's only one actually in whom the rules were not followed. But what is very impressive, and although the, uh, the primary endpoint is focusing on the one-year result, is that at 30 days, we have a dead stroke or myocardial infarction rate of less than 1%. And the major stroke patient was a patient in whom dual antiplate was stopped at 10 days, and he died. Another one happened post-procedurally, and the minor stroke was somebody who had a retinal infarction who was admitted initially for amaurosis fucax. So I would just like to state that this new type of stent, the Seaguard, definitely has potential, but we are still awaiting the results at one year. And especially if you combine it with proper protection I think carotid artery stenting, as already mentioned by Richard earlier today, may actually change the practice in the future. Thank you very much for your attention, and I think I'll give the floor to uh, Eric. This is perfect. Thank you so much, Isabel, and that was a perfect conclusion for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, symposium by uh, uh, inspiring the.